Good morning and welcome to another episode of Unscripted and Unchained RPG Review. I am DM Bloodworth and as you can see by the graphics, uh, today's video is uh, another return to the Castle Keeper's Guide of Castles and Crusades. Uh, we're still focusing on Chapter 4 NPCs and today I'm going to be talking about henchmen. So this is the 12th episode in an ongoing series on Castles and Crusades. Uh, the more and more I dig into this game, the, the more um, appreciative of how they really advanced, uh, Troll Lord games, how they really advanced, uh, advanced Dungeons & Dragons uh, to create a system that is far more streamlined, far more, and then yet at the same time, uh, nuanced and layered with... Uh, more and more of, uh, you know, optional rules and, uh, and expanded rules, but, but all of them just really do elevate the game play to match up with those three pillars of role playing, uh, whether it be combat, exploration, and, and in this case, uh, social interaction. So, um, uh, Without further ado, I'm going to jump right into it and start talking about henchmen. I'm just going to clear. So, again, um, you know, using the most up-to-date uh, printing of the Castle Keeper's Guide. Now, whether you have an older Castle Keeper's Guide or, or this current printing, um, the content of... Uh, the, the various uh, printings of, of the game books uh, doesn't really alter very much from one printing to the next or, or even multiple printings from beginning to, to now. The major changes are, are just in, in, in formatting and presentation and you know additional artwork here and there and some minor tweaks, uh, errata or... Um, you know, corrections, you know, um, you know, typos and that kind of thing. Uh, even though I, I haven't come across very many uh, to begin with, but uh, the rules are essentially the same as they have been from 2004 through, I know there were some changes in 2010, and then up till to now, you know, now 2021 was when this book uh, was, was printed. Um, there haven't been very many changes at all. Uh, just a few minor tweaks here and there as far as, uh, I believe, two character classes, uh, monks and, and barbarians were altered a bit. Uh, I did notice encumbrance was changed a little bit as well back in 2010. Still the same here, you know, at this point. So um, whether you have the newest editions, which I highly recommend, or, or newest printings, uh, particularly for these covers. These covers are awesome. Um, and if you just want a, a more modern uh, layout and, you know, accessibility that comes with, uh, you know, these new layouts, then, you know, I'd certainly recommend getting the most recent printings that you can. So, without further ado, let's get into Henchman now. Unfortunately, I don't have the PDF, so I can't, uh, you know, as I've been saying you know, throughout covering uh, covering the Castle Keeper's Guide, uh, as I, I did have the PDF for the uh, Player's Handbook. Uh, but anyway, here we go. Henchman. So last time I talked about um, last time I talked about uh, you know the hiring and creation of adherents and what role adherents have to play in that social interaction pillar uh, with the player character group. So now we're going to talk about Henchman. So Henchman, the Henchman is a class-based NPC hired by characters to augment a party, usually filling in gaps. For instance, a party without a rogue may seek to hire a skilled rogue to locate any traps and open any locked doors they encounter in the dungeons. Partly, um, a party who has a cleric 
who does not practice healing spells may wish to hire a cleric who does. Henchmen are used at all levels of play. They have highly variable loyalty and morale rates, depending on how they are treated and paid. They are expensive, as they are skilled warriors, wizards, clerics, and similar. Creating a henchman. Henchmen hold an unusual role in castles and crusades. Once hired, they become part of an adventuring party and act as do characters in almost every circumstance. They have the same skill sets and are considered adventurers of one stripe or another. Once a henchman is hired, the castle keeper should take a few minutes to create the henchman using the standard method of character creation as described in a player's handbook. Unlike all other NPCs, henchmen have the same six attribute characters to uh, do, as characters do, I'm sorry. Uh, their primary and secondary attributes are determined by the race and class needs as outlined in the player's handbook. All right, and they go through, you know, primary attributes, hit dice, alignment, the henchman hit dice is determined by the class, uh, so they're exactly the same creation as a regular player character. Developing the henchman. Once the CK rolls up the henchman, they should take time in fleshing them out, giving the henchman a name, a little background, and a few personality traits. There is a good chance the henchman has joined the party to stay. And if their loyalty and morale hold, and they continue as an employee of the party, it behooves the castle keeper to have a well-rounded, believable NPC from the beginning. Once the, end, uh, the henchman is complete and the personality outlined, the henchman is ready to enter play. Generally, the castle keeper plays or runs the henchman. The CK should be very careful in running henchmen, taking care to not allow the henchmen to dominate the party in decisions and actions. The henchmen should always be second fiddle to even the most uninvolved of the players and, char uh, and characters, their characters. This caution goes beyond game mechanics. A henchman may be more powerful than individual characters with better stats high hit points, etc., but they should not take away game time from the players as this will spoil everyone's fun. All right, so again, you know, the this is not, a henchman is not supposed to be the I come to save the day kind of a character. Meant solely to fill in the gap of, um, of potential uh, necessity that a, a party that is short uh, a certain type of character class uh, is to fill. Uh, if I were running a henchman with, uh, with my regular player party, um, he, he or she would only go into action when the situation uh, demanded it and with the instructions of one of the players you know, at the table. Um, now, I will certainly role play that henchman uh, the way that uh, his or her personality, you know, and, and function, you know, makes the most sense. But, um, you know, this isn't meant to be the castle keeper um, playing a character, uh, you know, throughout the entire you know, throughout the entire uh, adventure, throughout the entire, you know, every single scene and interaction, um, it's only when called upon that the henchman comes into play. Uh, I would, I would potentially avoid uh, having the, the henchman be a, um, like a frontline fighter or, or certainly making those decisions. Um, you know, and, and being the go-to, I would rather the, the a henchman being used as a support character, a healer after the battle is done, um, potentially the, the rogue, you know, 
picking that lock and you know um, you know listening you know listening or hiding in shadows probably never backstabbing or, or at least not trying to play that significant a role in a combat situation so um, yeah it, it, it's just a, a matter of taste and uh, discretion of the uh, of the castle keeper and how to manage you know henchmen so that they don't outshine players at the table. Locating henchmen. <coughs> henchmen reside in many different locations which are limited only by the demands of the adventure of the ca or, or the castle keeper. Uh, discretion. Uh, they are commonly sought out and hired in towns though it may fit in any of the adventure's narrative to have characters encounter them while on the road or, or, or whatnot. So you basically put the henchmen anywhere you wish. Um, and there's, there's various ways that you can do it. So um, henchmen uh, class. So in town, the far more likely place to locate a henchman is in a town, castle, or city. Here there are likely to be scores of unemployed adventurers, mercenaries, rogues, and other similar types looking for work. Uh, as noted above, the needs of the adventure should outrank any mechanics of play. If the party needs a cleric, it might behoove the castle keeper to have one present when the adventurers begin looking for henchmen. However, if the party or game, uh, or game is in need of a particular henchman, then they should leave the acquisition of the henchman up to chance. All right, so if they're not in a need, but they just want to say, hey, let's try to hire a henchman to come along with us, then you would just roll the d20 as they have here on the chart, and, uh, and then it will be determined. So a one to three is a fighter, a four to five is a uh, ranger, a rogue is a six to seven, an 8 is an assassin, a 9 is a barbarian, a 10 to 12 is a wizard, a 13 is an illusionist, a uh, 14 to 16 is a cleric, druid is 17, knight is 18, paladin is 19, and a bard is 20. Uh, kind of interesting, they make bards a little bit harder to get. I know, I know a lot of parties would probably want to bring along the bard. Um, just for the group buff and, and that kind of thing. So anyway, there are of course various uh, methods of finding henchmen. So from word of mouth to postings to a crier to an agent to a guild or order. So there are different ways that you can uh, create um, opportunities of finding henchmen that are not as um, not as proactive. On the part of the player party, so they can, uh, you know, they can rely on on these other methods, um, asking for information in a local tavern, looking at a posting board of of you know. The reverse of help wanted would be like uh, looking for jobs, uh, kind of thing, or a town crier might be, you know, calling off a, uh, you know people being sought after, you know, for a particular adventure. And so the party looks to see who, who answers the crier's call and then approaches them as well. Hey, you know what? We'll, um, we could actually use you for what we're doing. You know, so that kind of a thing. So there are many different ways that um, you, can, you can create that initial interaction. Methods of finding a henchman. So, and then they go through a table, right? So the word of mouth, the posting, um, the cost, you know, word of mouth is the cost is up to the castle keeper. Um, postings might cost uh, 10 gold pieces a week to actually post. And the, um, and then the difficulty of that might be Five plus uh, the level sought. So if you're looking for a specific level, all right, um, then let's say you're looking for level five 
then it would be 5 plus 5 or 10, so you have to roll a d20 and uh, roll a 10 or better in order to uh, in order for that posting to have attracted the right kind of a candidate. So hiring henchmen, we get into the actual effect of hiring a henchman. I'm just tipped over my just tipped over my mic. So hiring a henchman, uh, there are various considerations that come into play here. So there's payments and we see a chart down here of the startup payment. So fighters, rogues, barbarians, bards, rangers, archers, oath sworn, pacers, and thieves. Five gold, uh, 50 gold pieces times level. Salary per month, 10 gold pieces times level. So just to initially hire them, you're going to have to give them upfront money. And then on a regular basis, paying 10 gold pieces per month, per level. Uh, going forward. Wizards, illusionists, monks, paladins, knights, clerics, arcane, thieves, divine knights, magic users, seekers, and war priests, 100 gold pieces uh, times level. All right, for a startup, and then 15 gold pieces a level there beyond. And then finally, assassins, druids, forsworn, uh, ethereal knights, primal druids, and skulls, and rune marks, 125 times uh, a level, uh, so that's the most expensive, and then 12 gold pieces and 5 silver pieces times level. So 12 golds and 5 silver times the level per month. Uh, so interesting stuff. Uh, so the expenses of henchmen, so you also have to cover their expenses, uh, when you were hiring them, and, and that could include, um, you know, standard rooms and standard board and, and so on. The goals. The kinds of adventure the characters intend to hire the henchmen for are very important. Long, dangerous adventures with a small chance of monetary return and a high probability of death are not very appealing and play against the henchmen's desire to enlist. Though some may find the chance of death with no return exciting, the vast majority of people do not. Henchmen do not necessarily shy away from long journeys or even long commitments as they offer the opportunity for long-term employment. But there also has to be some type of return for the henchmen. Simple adventures involving dungeon crawl, looting ruins, or hunting monsters are typical scenarios no henchman would think twice about accepting. <coughs> However, a goal of attacking the Horned God in his towers of uh, Ofstrag is not something many would willingly sign up for. All right, uh, responsibility is a clear definition of what the party requires of the prospective henchman certainly plays into whether the henchman takes the job or not. These are all interactions that the players have to have uh, through their characters with the prospective henchmen. They're trying to sell the advantages of becoming their employee. All right, and uh, I would certainly require that they role play this out. Uh, it, it's not a, an automatic thing that a henchman is just going to join you know, and, and follow along with them. Compatibility and treasure. So there has to be some kind of a appropriate uh, treasure split. Uh, above and beyond the payments that they're getting, you know, for their, their upkeep in their room and their board and their, um, you know, and the starting fees and, and so on. So there's a list of, you know, supply expenses and, and whether or not, if they're offered supply expenses, then that's going to make their acceptance of the, of the uh, position higher. All right. It's going to lower your, um, it's going to lower your, um, your difficulty in getting them to agree to tie on. If you're giving more treasure, then it's going, again, lower the difficulty. So if they're offered an equal share 
bonuses and powerful magic items, it's a minus four on the, on the challenge level. So if you needed a 12, now you only need an eight to roll on a d20 in order to get them to enlist because you're offering that amount. Goals and challenges, though, if you match the goals and challenges uh, requirements of the henchmen, then it makes it easier for them to sign on with you, and so on. So there's the starting fee, the supplies expenses, the treasure, the goals and challenges, the responsibilities, and the compatibility. All of these things come into play in whether or not the hireling or potential henchman is going to uh, sign on with your player party. Retaining henchman's loyalty. So again, it uses a loyalty system or a morale system and the loyalty rating and its effect. So a fail check minus 10 Challenge level four, despise his character, will flee or attempt to kill them. All right, so if, if at the worst case scenario, their, their loyalty has been tainted to such a degree, you know, coming down to as much as a minus 10 or below, the, there's a, a challenge level of a four that they will attack you. And continuing on through, uh, made the check at plus 10, challenge level minus 3, all right, so makes it extremely loyal, will sacrifice own life to save the character, all right, so you have the two far extremes looking at the loyalty rating and its effect, okay? And then there is a morale and reactions table that also go on. A henchman's morale is noticeably different from their loyalty, whereas loyalty is a constant thing, morale is episodic. It dry, it's driven by the situation extreme danger can cause even the most loyal to break, as their natural inclination to flee may override their sense of duty or friendship. All right, so, and that's very important to remember that there's, there's loyalty and then there's morale, two separate things. And, um, you know, bringing it together. So I will switch views here because we're done with this part. Uh, bringing it all together, it's important to remember that a henchman is a classed NPC. They have all of the stats and features of a regular player character. They, uh, the only difference is, is that they, um, they have to be hired on <coughs> by the party. Uh, their loyalty and their morale needs to be maintained. Uh, they're getting a fee above and beyond what, uh, what might come along as a split in a treasure. Uh, so, so that's another thing that has to be remembered. And their they're not meant to outshine or even shine equally well with uh, as a replacement for another player uh, you know at the table. So when the castle keeper is is controlling a henchman, uh, I think one of the biggest struggles is, is uh, you know the henchman isn't supposed to be all-knowing. And, you know, they shouldn't be making decisions, you know, because the castle keeper knows everything that's going on, obviously. And so if the henchman was reflecting the knowledge of the castle keeper, you're going to break the whole dynamic, you know, of the group and, and of the game experience, right? It's going to be, as they stated, it's going to be less fun for everybody at the table if the, if the henchman under the castle keeper's control always has that answer, you know, or is uh, always coming to save the day, you know, and so on. So it's, it's important 
to utilize them in a, uh, a very specific goal, uh, a, a very specific way, I should say, and uh, as a support uh, character rather than a character that's leading the way. Uh, so they, they only come in in certain situations as a support, um, such as like, like the, the book had mentioned, you know, picking a lock or, you know, if there's no rogue in the, in the group, well, they're going to come in, they're going to pick the lock, they're going to search for a trap, or they're going to be a cleric that heals after the combat is concerned. It might be a pure healer cleric uh, instead of one that has various buffing spells and, and the like. Um, it's always best for the, the player group to, you know, and, and the castle keeper is part of that player group, uh, to bring in another player if they really need somebody to play that specific role in their, in their party. And so, um, yeah, there's, I mean, I've done this before too. It's like I have a, you know, a player or two leave a campaign and instead of just inserting, uh, you know, henchmen to fill in those gaps, I just search around to find another player or two to come in. It's never been a difficult thing to have, you know, to have players look to join uh, old school games. I, I've never had a problem filling in the, uh, you know, filling in the table, uh, whether it's AD&D first edition, and I didn't have a problem attracting uh, between five and seven player players to my Castles and Crusades table. Uh, which just started this past Tuesday. So, um, so depending on the game, it's fairly easy uh, to attract players to your table. So, um, so henchman is, is, is just another way for you to up the amount of social interaction that's taking place during your campaign. Um, you know, I would... I would certainly craft uh, a henchman uh, for very specific support roles um, that, and make it where they're only going to sign on with the player party for um, a very specific time period. And once that task is done, they're not going to just follow off with the player party. They're going to move on to their, their next town or their next you know, city or whatever, their next adventure that takes them away from this region and then the henchmen will remain and, and look for new employment in their local area. But the henchman doesn't leave the, um, the henchman doesn't leave the, uh, the consciousness and, and, you know, of the player party. They remember that that person is still there if they ever end up going back there again then they, um, you know, they have that contact that's still uh, someone that they can approach or, or maybe even that can lead into a, uh, you know, a different adventure, right? So player party is introduced to a, a henchman. They hire that person on. They adventure a little bit with that person. They leave that person behind, you know, with a lot of goodwill amongst the two groups. They go off, you know, and then months later they hear that uh, something has happened to uh, this henchman or, or this henchman's family and the henchman is reaching out uh, to the party, you know, please come back, you know, I, I have a need for you. And that's a good way to, you know, as, a, as an adventure hook, to bring them back to a previous place or, or to make that connection again. And it, it makes it a very real, believable uh, social interaction. Because, uh, you know, that's how a lot of people function, you know, in, in, in real life. You go to a place, you meet new people and everything. You, you have some connection with them. And then even if you go away, I mean, when we, when we go on vacation, um, my family and I, when we go on vacation, we go to the same place almost every single year. And, uh, and, and some of the people, like our, our taxi driver that drives us from the airport, you know, and, and to the resort and everything, uh, we, we know this guy by name. He knows us right away. 
He knows exactly what we want to do as soon as we get there. And uh, it's a really good relationship. Um, that's the kind of thing that you're looking to create with uh, these henchmen. You know, uh, creating a, even if it is a separation after w months or so, uh, that the knowledge of that person is still in uh, your player characters. And uh, that person is also going to remember your player characters as well and possibly call upon them in the future. So I hope you enjoyed this video. And, uh, you know, as always, you know, I look forward to seeing you on the gaming screen sometime soon. I now have two campaigns running. So I have an AD&D first edition campaign and a Castle Key, uh, Castle, Castles and Crusades uh, campaign running. And... Um, I'll see. I'll look to do some one shots uh, coming up in the, in the near future. Uh, probably Conan 2D20 uh, as I test out some. Uh, I test out some of the old adventure modules that uh, I had written uh, back, you know, as early as you know 2017 or 18, and uh, look to uh, make those suitable for uh, publication, uh, or at least at the very least sharing. And um, as always, look forward to seeing you on the gaming screen sometime soon. And, uh, you know, stay safe out there. It's almost the weekend, so enjoy your weekend. And uh, I'll be back in the next couple of days with a few. Uh, I have a wedding tomorrow. Uh, and then Sunday is um, Virtual Greyhawk Con. So I will be playing most of the day Sunday. And uh, I'll, I'll give a little uh, video as a recap of the experience that I had, uh, you know, on Sunday through Sunday's games. So uh, that, that'll be coming up uh, probably Sunday afternoon or evening. I'll do that video really quickly. So, again, thanks for joining. Hope you like this video. And uh, if you haven't subscribed, please consider subscribing. And the next one coming up is going to be... Uh, NPC hirelings, which again is a little bit different than uh, than henchmen and a little bit different than adherents. And so when we get to hirelings, and then I'll do a final video wrapping up the whole NPC section and do a compare and contrast. I was asked to do some comparisons between you know how NPCs are handled in uh, castles and crusades, how were they handled in uh, AD&D first edition, and then how are they handled in, uh, in 5e. So I will make that comparison between the three. So again, thanks for joining. Have a great day.